back now, something to study a little bit perhaps later today or later in the week. Revelation chapter 4 in your Bibles, please. We would like to, uh, I, I want to take a moment and acknowledge the fact that uh, there are a number of people that are watching the live stream of our sermon today. And we welcome you who are watching. And we hope that as it goes down the road a piece that you will feel more and more comfortable about returning to church. But uh, we do have an online presence and we are amazed by the number of people that are checking out our website and uh, on the Facebook and on the live streaming. And we welcome all of those folks with us today. You will notice in the bulletin I've entitled the sermon, Heavenly Rewards. As I mentioned a few moments ago, we began to talk about heaven. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that judgment is for believers. It is not for unsaved people. The unsaved will also go through a judgment. That is later. We'll talk about that here several months down the line. Uh, by the way, uh, we began this series in uh, the, the last part uh, of September of 2020 on signs of the times. And I always leave my planning open, uh, subject to change, uh, if things change somehow or if the Lord changes the direction that we should go. But at any rate, I, I do have it kind of charted out, and um, we're going to continue our series here on signs of the times almost to Thanksgiving of 2021. And so we have a long way to go, uh, but there will be many, many exciting things upcoming. In your Bibles, please, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 10. Here is the scene in heaven. Chapter 4 is the redeemed in heaven, praising God, creation. Chapter 5 is the scene of those in heaven, praising God for redemption. But if you would please look at verse 10 of chapter 4. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. <coughs> this text really sums up all the questions and all the answers regarding eternal rewards. My friends, you and I are going to look at there are five different crowns that the Bible speaks of that are for the believers, that are for the people of God. And then the Word of God makes it clear that all of the rewards, all of the crowns, will be returned to the one that is worthy of all praise and adoration. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get the impression that there will be people in heaven with a 14-foot crown on their head because of all the things they did down here on earth. I uh, am aware of a preacher who uh, always said that uh, um, his favorite verse was Daniel 12 and verse 3, They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the firmament. And really what it was all about was a focus on man. By the way, that wears me thin when you begin to focus on man. 
I've been here for 67 years. I've seen man at his worst, and I've seen man at his best. And guess what? I'm underwhelmed. And you are underwhelmed as well. This is not about us. This is not about, oh, well, when you get to heaven, oh, there will be certain people who will be in high and exalted places, and uh, they're great soul winners, and they're great preachers, and, and so forth. No, I want to tell you something, my friends. All the rewards, all the crowns, all of the praise, all of the accolades are willingly, willingly, and completely given over to the one who redeemed us in the first place. And if we get any crown at all, we'll be more than happy to join in with everybody else and place the crown, the crown at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's what it's all about. Now, I would like for you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. Now, our theme a couple of weeks ago was from this text. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let me remind you of a couple of things that we said there. Notice it says, for we must all all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, that, my friend, or that word all is qualified. I've had untold people tell me, young man, that's when I was younger, young man, all means all, all the time, and that's all that all has ever meant. No, this context, for we must all appear, that is all believers. It is a qualified all. Okay? Uh, for example, if we said all of us here today, all of us, okay? That's this group of people. This group of people is slightly different from the group of people that we had here last Sunday. So when we are saying all, it is qualified. All that are here present in the auditorium this morning. There's another all, and that is those, those group of people, whoever they might be, who are watching this online. So it's all of them and all of us. My friends, this is qualified, for we must all appear, all Christians. Because the Bible makes it clear in the book of Revelation that there will be another judgment and all of the unredeemed will stand in that judgment. You say, well, how do you, how do you know how to use a word? Write this in your Bible somewhere. The context determines the use of the word. The context determines the use of the word. Our context here is all believers. Now, we've settled that, but we must all appear. Now, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it explains it a little bit differently, beginning in verse 11. For, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Okay? Look at verse 15. If any man's work, uh, shall, be, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what happens? At the judgment seat of Christ, our sin is not judged. Let me give you the good news. Our sin is not judged. You say, well, pastor, I will not be accountable ever for my sin. The answer is no. There's somebody who already accounted for your sin. There is somebody who already paid the price for your sin. There's someone who paid the debt. His name is Jesus. And because of the work of the cross 
I will not have to answer for my sins. They've already been answered for. And you, if you are a believer, you will not have to answer for your sins. They've already been accounted for. They've already been answered for. Can anybody say praise the Lord? That's exciting. That's exciting. Now, what this is, is a critique primarily of our motivation. Of our motivation. Oh, my motives? Why do I do what I do? Uh, let, let's use this for an example. We might have some people that sit in this section who are doing something religious or something Christian and um, I almost feel bad that I've selected a particular section, but I'm already here. Let's say that there are some people over here who say, my objective, I do what I do as a Christian, is because I want the people who sit over here to be impressed with my spirituality. Is there a reward for that? None at all. None at all. None at all. And a lot of times we have to ask ourselves a question. Why do we do what we do? We should do what we do for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. That should be our motivation. He is the one that we're seeking to please. And we're not here to impress other people. We're here to glorify Jesus Christ. Now, notice here in verse 13, there is, uh, uh, in verse 12, there's mention of gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. What does that mean? Our motivation will be tested by fire. If it's made of gold and silver and precious stones, you may modify the form. If you heat it up, put it in the fire, you may modify its form. But if you heat up gold, you've still got gold. You heat up silver, you've still got silver. But you heat up wood, hay, and stubble, and you test that with fire, all you're going to get is some ashes. Ashes. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about a critique of our motive. Now, we're going to emphasize today what are the gold and silver and precious stone? What are the rewards and crowns that are mentioned in Scripture? Here we go. Number one, the incorruptible crown. You're there in 1 Corinthians. Go to chapter number 9. Chapter 9, and Paul mentions there the incorruptible crown. Okay? Now, watch in verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. So uh, I, therefore, so run, not as, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but keep my body under my body, and bring it under subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, let me tell you something, my friend. Every Christian here today has a race to run. It's your life. It's different. It is completely separate from anyone else. Even if you are a married person, and it's the, the beauty of marriage and the unit of marriage, even with that, you still are an individual, and you have a race to run. Now, notice what Paul said in verse 25. Every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. Therefore I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so I fight, 
not as one that beateth the air. So I'm not out here just flailing around trying to do this or that. No, I have a run. I have a race. I have a track. There are certain things that God requires of me that He does not require of you. There are certain things that God requires of you that He does not require of me. Every individual Christian has a race to run. And what Paul is talking about here is self-control and personal godliness. And there is an incorruptible crown. For those believers who say, this is the path that God has given me. I'm going to do the best I can with it. When I, when I fail, I'll make it right and get it back on that path. But there is a reward, an incorruptible crown for those who pursue the things of God. Number two, there is the crown of rejoicing. Now, turn with me, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, here Paul is talking to uh, the Thessalonian Christians about uh, being saved and, and so forth, and he talked about the people in Thessalonica. Notice what he said in verse 19. What is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are our glory and joy. This is the crown of rejoicing. And listen carefully. This is the crown of rejoicing for those who have been able to influence other people for Christ. Now, what we find here in verse 19 is exuberant expression. Paul is joyful. He says, you are our crown, the crown of rejoicing. One of the greatest joys of life is to have part in what God is doing to bring someone to faith. Remember, Paul said it also here in 1 Corinthians. He said, one planted, one watered, but God gave the increase. Our job is to plant the seed. Our job is to water the seed. It is God's job to produce the harvest. And He always has, He does today, and He always will. What we're talking about, a crown of rejoicing, is being a part of that. Being a little part of that. Passing that cup of water in Jesus' name. So what do you do this? What do you do tomorrow? What do you do this next week? You say, I want to have an impact. Well, you can have an impact for the gospel, my friend, if you will live your life as a Christian, if you will exert yourself to say, I have responsibility to my fellow man. And you know one of the best ways to do it is exactly what Paul is talking about right here, and that is to have some joy. There's nothing wrong with having some joy in your heart about being saved. And there's certainly nothing wrong with letting that joy be expressed right here. The song says, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Now, there's a lot of people I've met through the years who want to sing that song a little bit in a minor key. I've got the joy, joy down in my heart. I used to have a lot of fun in life. Then I got saved. I can't do anything anymore. I can't be excited about anything anymore. Some people have an expression on their face that looks like they've been weaned on a dill pickle. 
What did Paul say here? He talked about joy. My, uh, my friends, let me help you with your witness. Let me help you with how you're going to do the work of evangelism. By the way, it's, all, it's tougher than it's ever been before. It's tough. It's hard. When you're wearing a mask like we have for the last year, how do you show joy? You can't look at somebody and say, underneath this mask I have some joy. Okay? That, that makes it kind of tough. So all the rules have changed a little bit, but don't let that get in your way. Uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a little more freedom. You know one of the best things you can do to people right now as things begin to open up and, and so forth? You know one of the best things you can do is to let people know that you have a little bit of joy in life because you have joy right here. The other day I got a text from a fellow who works in our city here, and as you are aware, I'm on the city council. And uh, he uh, put out a text that said he was moving on from his position. So I called him. I left a message. And I didn't express any joy. I said, this is council member Stirk, and I'm not happy, and I expect you to call. A couple hours later, this fellow got on the phone, and you could tell he was kind of sheepish about it, and I, when the call came in, I saw that it was from him, so I wanted to keep up the game. And so when he called, I said, What? And he said, oh, Council Member Stirk, how are you? I said, as I mentioned in my text, I'm not having a good day. I, he said, well, I'm sorry about that. I said, and you're the problem. You're the guy moving on. And boy, I played with that for a long time and so forth. He knew I was kidding. Then he said something to me that kind of blessed my day. He said, so you know, he said, you and I have always worked together, and we've had a lot of fun doing it. He said, I've always appreciated your approach. He said, even when we tackled some problems together, you were always optimistic and always believing. And he said, you have touched my life as a Christian. I thought, wow. 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 You know what you can do if you want to touch people's lives? Just show some joy and let them try to figure out what it is that you are so happy about. You say you got Bible for that? Yes, I do. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. What does it say there? It says to live your life in such a way that people will ask you of the hope that lieth within you. Yeah, they're, they're going to see something different, and they're going to see some joy. You know, we've, we've been in a world the last year or so that's been up and down and twisted inside and out and bent in every possible direction. What's the best way to go forward? How do you deal with people? You know, one of the best things you can do, whether there's a pandemic or not, or the tail end of a pandemic or not, it's just an everyday thing that should be true of the people of God, is that we are enjoying ourselves, we're enjoying the fact that our sins are forgiven, and we're Furthermore, enjoying the fact that Jesus could come today. Hope he waits till after lunch. Number three is the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. I want you to see it. This is one of the most incredible verses in all of the Word of God. 2 Timothy is the last will and testament of the Apostle Paul. He knew full well that before long he'd be in the presence of Christ. He'd been through so much. He'd been through so many struggles. He'd been through so much for the witness of Christ and for the gospel's sake. He said, I've been shipwrecked. I've been left for dead. 
I've been beaten with whips. I've been beaten with rods. I've had people misunderstand me. And in the midst of all of that, he kept talking about joy over and over and over and over. Now, this is his last will and testament. He writes this book to to a young fellow by the name of Timothy. Look at verse 8. Henceforth, now look at verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. For those longing for the second coming of Christ, through struggle, through endurance, through discipline, and final victory. What Paul is saying to us here, there's a crown of righteousness. Every time you cry out, Oh, Lord Jesus, come quickly. There is a crown of righteousness. Number four, the crown of life. James chapter 1, please, toward the end of your Bible, you'll find Hebrew and James, a short book, chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive a crown of life. This is a crown of life in recognition of those enduring and triumphing over temptations and trials. Those who've overcome. Those who have endured. They will receive a crown of life. You ever take notice of the fact that God allows suffering in the lives of His people? God allows it. God allows it. God is glorified through it, and what He is doing with you and me, He's whittling on us, chiseling on us, making us into the image of Jesus Christ. Suffering can be a real part of a Christian's experience. It can be emotional suffering, spiritual suffering, financial suffering, physical suffering. Social suffering. Financial suffering. But there is a crown of life for those who endure and those who keep marching on for Jesus Christ. Let's go to number five. The crown of glory. Now, just a couple of pages. You'll find 1 Peter chapter 5. There's the crown of glory. And this is the crown for faithful servants and pastors and teachers. Notice, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. When I was a younger man, in fact, I was just a kid, I started preaching when I was 18 years old. The first sermon I ever preached was in September of 1972 at the Sumnerville Bible Baptist Church of Niles, Michigan. A month later, in October of 1972, I had the privilege of preaching again. It was at the Beacon Baptist Church of Kendallville, Indiana. The other couple weeks ago, a month ago, Jim Galloway and I, on our trip, we went through Kendallville. We stopped at that church. Jim says, you remember the church? I said, no, no, I don't remember the building. 
I don't remember anything but the fact that I preached there. When I began preaching and our family was gospel singers and so forth, I had the privilege of being around literally hundreds and hundreds of some of the best people God ever made. I was around a lot of preachers. I remember preaching at the First Baptist Church of Butler, Pennsylvania. And the preacher, Dr. Russell Camp, he had me come into his office before the service. He said, now, young man, I want to pray with you before you preach tonight. I said, uh, great, great. And when he was praying, he said, Lord, bless this young man tonight. He is the most important man in Butler, Pennsylvania. I thought, whoa, that's kind of cool. Now, he didn't mean it because I was young or talented or had any, uh, any punch at all. He meant that because I would stand in the pulpit of the First Baptist Church and preach Jesus Christ, Him crucified, buried, and risen again. I was around a lot of preachers. I was around a lot of preachers who this text applied to. Maybe you've heard me tell this story before. But I preached in western Illinois, close to, the, close to the river, close to the Mississippi River. And because the Mississippi has been flooded so many times, there is the blackest soil you've ever seen in your entire life. I asked one of the fellows there, I said, how deep is your topsoil? I mean, black as coal. He said, well, underneath the uh, topsoil, there, there is a vein of coal. I said, really? He said, yeah, on top of that, there are 75 feet of topsoil. That's incredible. That is absolutely amazing. But it was out in that country, and there was a small church there, and uh, I, I got acquainted with the preacher. I preached every night there for almost a week, and I got, I got acquainted with the preacher. And some of you have never heard this story. That's why I'm telling you it. And if I, if I don't have a story in my sermon, some of you walk out and say, that wasn't very good. So here it comes. I was staying in the preacher's home. I don't know, I was 20, 21 years old. And I said, Pastor, you don't have a big enough, I don't know how all of this works, I'm just a young guy, but you don't have enough people in your church to, uh, to pay your salary and to pay a missions budget and to pay for the heat and the lights and, and the insurance and so forth. I said, you probably work. He said, yes, we do. I said, we? He said, yeah, the whole family. And he said, if you want to go with us tomorrow... We're going over to the Quad Cities. Wasn't far, 30 minutes away. Quad Cities are Rock Island and Moline, Illinois, across the river, Bettendorf and Muscatine, Iowa. He said, we're going to work there tomorrow. Would you like to go with us? I said, sure, I'll be glad to help. And he said, what we do is we sell snow cones. You... Do what? He said, yeah, we, we make a lot of money selling snow cones. And I thought, cool, let's do it. So they had a van, and they had the door that would slide open. They had a little booth there with big bottles of syrup. It was hot and muggy, and it's a, it can be 85 degrees and 185% humidity in that part of the world. And so he says, do you want to sell the snow cones? I said, yes, I do. And I'll tell you, before that day was done, I was really getting good at it. I said, you want a double squirt? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my word. It's almost 50 years later, and I'm telling you a story that's as true as this day is true. You say, what's his name? I don't remember. 
I could probably research it and find it out. But he was a preacher who did whatever it took to stay in the ministry. You ready for this? Now, post-COVID crisis, I don't know. Pre-COVID, the numbers showed that six out of every ten pastors had two or more jobs. They're all bivocational. I have been bivocational. Sixty percent. I would dare say, and probably if anything, the number has gone up of men who've said, God called me to preach, and God didn't provide all of the means yet, but we're going to do whatever we can because I have something within me. I have to preach. I have to do it. By the way, the statistics also show that a lot of preachers my age who have said, I'm going to keep going a while, in the last year, and all of the pressure have said, no, I'm done. I, I, I'm, I can't do it anymore. can't do it anymore. And they're dropping out like flies. Churches all across this land are begging for pastors. And they're, they're in, we're, we're in trouble in Christianity because I want to tell you something, my friends. That generation of people that were willing to sacrifice and to sell snow cones and dig ditches for the privilege of preaching the gospel, that generation is long gone. New generations, oh, they want everything handed to them on a platter. They want it all. And it doesn't work that way. Now, let's go back to Revelation 4. These crowns are wonderful. It's God's idea. There will be crowns. There will be reward, rewards for all of the people of God. But all of these crowns and rewards pale into significance in the presence of Jesus Christ. Paul himself, who was a faithful man and a faithful preacher, he said, I, I will have the crown of righteousness. I will have the crown of life. I will have the crown of glory. And he said, all of that, I'm willing to give up, all of it, so that I may win Jesus Christ. Do what you do because it's the right thing to do. Do it with a pure motive. You will be rewarded for it. And when you are rewarded for it, you will have the privilege of bowing before the presence of Jesus Christ and saying, Thou alone are worthy. You alone. You alone. Father in heaven, heaven and all that it is is a wonderful thing. Lord, every person here today has in their mind in their heart their own picture of heaven. Father, first of all, thank you for that. Lord, may we never lose that picture that we have in our minds. Yet at the same time, we're reminded of Scripture that eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, nor enter the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love Him. Lord, our best picture is just an attempt. And Lord, it'll be 10 million times greater than that. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray. Lord, I pray that you would 
touch our lives in such a way that heaven will mean more to us with every passing day. And we'll do it, we'll do what we do out of a heart of motivation of love for Jesus Christ. Bless us with this word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, the most important thing we have in our bulletin, I say this repeatedly, right here in the middle, after the service, you might say, hey, wait a minute, I don't even know if I'm going to heaven. We've got people that can talk to you about that. You say, well, I'm a Christian, and boy, I'm not living like I, I'm not living like I should. Well, we've got people that can pray with you about that. They'll be in that room over there. They'll be happy to open the Bible and show you a couple of things from the Word of God. God. Hope you've enjoyed this today. We have a final song. We have a final song. And our song today is um, a, a chorus. And it's number 520 if you want to use the book. And our chorus, I want all of us to stand and I want us to know that we will be led in this song by East Wenatchee's number two song later. Okay? And uh, here we go. This is a good little song. I just keep trusting my Lord. What a good thought as we leave today. Everyone singing. I just keep trusting my Lord as I walk along. I just keep trusting my Lord and He gives a song. Though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord. He will never fail. He's a faithful friend, such a faithful friend. I can count on Him to the very and though the storm clouds darken the sky or the heavenly trail, I just keep trusting my Lord, He will never fail. With that, we're going to conclude our service today. Now, there's one more thing that you'll receive a reward for. It kind of fits into all of these categories, and that is being good to your family. Now, you might say, I'm already good to my family. Okay, that's fine. What I'm talking about is being good.